Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue on with our quarantine reflections on the book of First Peter. Uh, just to review and recap a, a few minutes, um, we talked about how the book of First Peter is written by Peter, uh, an apostle of Jesus, uh, who we called a bundle of contradictions. But he's also writing to uh, the people that he calls the, the scattered strangers, the strangers who are scattered, the exiles who are scattered. And uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, hope given to those scattered strangers. And even though our situation isn't the same as their situation, uh, the truth that he gives us is still applicable to our lives today. And so we're going to see reasons for uh, uh, these scattered strangers to have hope in the middle of their, their tough times and in their rough days. Uh, I love the book of 1 Peter. In fact, it's one of the books that I preached um, through uh, at DCC for um, one of the very first books I ever preached through way, way back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, some of you might remember it. In fact, I remember what we called that sermon series. We called it The Good Life. And we were talking about how because of what God has done for us, we have the good life even when it doesn't seem like it, even when it doesn't look like it, even when it doesn't feel like it. And so uh, that's this whole story uh, of First Peter. It's written by Peter to those who are going through a horrible time, to the scattered strangers. And one of the very first things he tells them is, is that you have hope. You can have hope, you scattered strangers, because of the salvation that God has given you. And so we're going to read through First uh, Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and it's going to be beautiful, beautiful. So let's read that together. It says this, it says, uh, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, in all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. Your faith is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire. But that proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for your receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I love this passage of scripture. I love how Peter describes our salvation in Christ. It, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Check it out. He, he mentions uh, all the way up here at the top. He mentions, uh, you know, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. See, here's what happened. I, I, I love when we get to talk about the new birth because the new birth is, is, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. What he's given us is this uh, I'm a video game player, right? Okay, I, I like to play video games. And I know that, uh, you know, if I'm playing a video game, I'm going along, I got little Mario and he's hopping around, jumping on the little Koopa Turtles and he's throwing shells and he's spitting fireballs and he's flying like a raccoon. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, but he does fly like a raccoon. If he's doing all those things and I drop him down an endless pit or I let, you know, Bowser smash him into oblivion, you know what I can do every single time? I can hit that reset button. And when I hit that reset button, we start over and we start fresh and we start new. It's, it's, a, it's a brand new beginning. It's a brand new birth. Anything that had happened, it's gone and we've started over. And see, here's this beautiful thing. Jesus has given us this, this new birth. He's handed us a brand new life that has started over. Okay? We're not just 
We're not just patching up the old. Uh, he, Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians. He says that, you know, when we're in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And we're given this new birth into a living hope. It's something that is alive and carries us through no matter what. Because we have this new birth in Christ, because we're this new creation in Christ, we have this living hope, okay? And I want you to catch this, okay? This is a promise that's not made for us in any, uh, with any false assurances, in any way that is less than. You see, this is a promise that is made and founded, and sealed, and confirmed for us because of what Jesus has done. Do you see that up here? He's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do, uh, this is the, the, you know, here we're celebrating Easter today, right? We're celebrating Easter today. And, and I love what N.T. Wright writes. He says, becoming a Christian means that what God did for Jesus at Easter, he does for you into the very depth of your being. Because Jesus rose from the dead, because he has the power uh, to, to rise from the dead, because God rose him from the dead, he can take your soul blackened, tarred, and dead by sin, and he can make you alive. It's because of Easter that we have this salvation. And when we're walking through dark times, when we're walking through dark times, we need to remember that we have been given a new birth into a living hope because of what Jesus has done. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have this beautiful, beautiful thing. And so because of what Jesus has done, we have a hope that drives us towards this, 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 this future. And it's, and it's beautiful. Uh, uh, read on here. It says, uh, he's given us uh, this, uh, this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Jesus has given us, because of his resurrection, we have an inheritance that is reserved for us. We, we've been written into his will. And we have an inheritance, and it's an inheritance that can't perish, spoil, or fade. Everything in our life, everything that we know is, is, is perishable, right? I mean, everything. It, it feels like everything wears out and spoils, right? We've got, we've got milk that's going to turn when we leave it in the fridge too long. We've got meat that's going to go bad. We've got, uh, we've got vegetables that rot, right? We have an inheritance in Christ, though. It's something that never fades away. The glimmer never leaves. It never it goes into dysfunction. It never turns into a junked up junkyard of a yard, right? We have this inheritance that never perishes, spoils, or fade, and, and it's kept in heaven for us. It's this beautiful inheritance. See, if there's something that can carry us through dark days, it's the it's the salvation that we have that promises us there is life eternal. There is life beyond. There is life ongoing after this one. And that inheritance, that inheritance is better than anything we've ever experienced or imagined before. It's better. We're going to come back to this in just a minute because I want to look a little bit closer here as we go on. It says, uh, so, so we've got this, uh, this salvation that's rooted in the past, the resurrection of Jesus, right? That's a, that holds a promise for the future. That's that inheritance waiting for us in heaven. But there are some things that happen now in the present. Because of the salvation we have in Jesus, there's some things that are now, that happen right here. And it says this, verse 5, do you see it? who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, you've been through some hard times, and you read that, and you say, hey, I thought I had faith, but why hasn't God shielded me? Right? Why hasn't God shielded me by his power? One of my favorite preachers, Bob Russell, 
He likes to talk about uh, this shielding of God's power being something that we don't always realize is there, but we would realize if it wasn't there. And he talks about it, it with this illustration, he talks about it as, as one of those little, uh, those little uh, face shields that people have on the front of a motorcycle. Right. Uh, as you're driving along and you look at a motorcycle and you think somebody's going to be riding in this open air vehicle that's not enclosed. Right. And they're going to be driving down the road. And, and what in the world is this little this little half a windshield going to do for you? Well, what is this little windshield going to accomplish for you? Uh, but what you don't realize is that it blocks so many bugs uh, from flying and hitting you in the face or hitting you on your own helmet and, and all of that kind of thing. It, it, you know, hey, you may not think it's doing anything, but it just uh, nicked a little cicada that would have been a mouthful for you, right? It just nicked a mosquito that would have splattered blood all over your, your face mask, right? It, he, what he says is this, is uh, that we don't always realize how much God is shielding us by his power. I've seen moments in my life that I just wonder what would happen if I had been three feet that way on the road, right? We got into an accident on 404 years ago. Roseanne was driving. Uh, we totaled our car in that, but if we had gone three feet one way or the other, we may have had dead family members shielded by God's power even in an accident. I found myself caught in the middle uh, of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, right? Just by, not, not by feet this time, but by minutes this time where I was, I, I would have been in a building that fell, that crashed, that crumbled, that was flattened, shielded by God's power. See, we're here in the midst of a global pandemic. And I honestly believe that God is still shielding by his power. Man, I see some beautiful things happening. I see people growing closer to one another in their homes, right? I see some beautiful things happening out there in the, in the healthcare field. There are some amazing doctors and nurses and researchers that are finding and working on solutions to this. And, and it's beautiful. I see, I see God's shielding power at work in my own family, in our church, in, wow, in, in, in so many different ways. And it's beautiful. And here's the thing. We may not always realize where his shielding power is at work, but it's at work in us. And we, we can find hope in that. And we got this right here. So who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have this new birth that gives us salvation, but we know that it's not complete until Jesus returns and we have that eternity with him. And this is what it says. In all this, in all this, because we have this new birth into a living hope that was from the resurrection of Jesus, because we have this inheritance that is imperishable, uh, just, just saved up for us in heaven, because we through faith are shielded by God's power, because of all of this, we rejoice. Brothers and sisters, if you are not finding reasons for joy in Jesus at this time, you are missing it. Jesus says that because of what he's done, we rejoice even though, I love this, in all this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, you might, you may, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. One of the hardest truths that we have to, to have to know and have to realize is that even with God's shielding power in our life, God deepens us in hardships. See, when we find ourselves in the midst of uh, situations that we don't know what to do with, and when we find ourselves in the midst of hardship and trials and suffering, uh, when we're facing temptation, a truth that I know is that God deepens us and hardship. And, and this is what it says. It says, in all this you greatly rejoice, even now, even though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, 
of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though fire, uh, refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor. It, this beautiful thing. See, here's what happens. Is, is gold, when it is refined by fire, and the impurities are removed, it becomes more valuable. When we go through hardship, and when the impurities are removed, when God deepens us through hardship, we find out that our faith is worth far more than gold or, or anything else. We find that, that, that what he has for us is more. What he has for us is better. And so as we're walking through hardship, as we're walking through trying times, we have to remember that what God has ahead of us is better than what we're walking through now. And all of our hardships, all of our problems might not be resolved here. It might not be resolved next week or next month or next year. It might never be resolved in this lifetime. But I know one thing, it will be resolved in heaven. You know what I know? I know that there will be no wheelchairs in heaven. Can I get an amen? I know that there will be no eyeglasses in heaven. I know that there will be no disabilities in heaven. I know that there will be no depression in heaven. There's not going to be any Xanax in heaven. You get to leave that one behind. I know that there's not going to be any pain in heaven. There's not going to be any Midol in heaven. Did I just say that? Okay, we'll have to edit that one out. All right, no problem. I know... That God is going to resolve everything. But right now, if we're walking through hardship, if you're walking through hardship, if you're walking through trials, temptations, suffering, if you're walking that road, God can use that to deepen you. God can use that to grow your faith. Your faith which is of greater worth than gold. And here's what happens. When we're tried, when we're tested, when we walk through that hardship, do you see what it says? It says that uh, that, that genuineness of your faith will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, usually when we use the phrase praise, glory, and honor, we're referring to something that we give to Jesus. Honestly, almost Every spot throughout Scripture, when we talk about giving praise, giving glory, giving honor, we talk about what we're giving to Jesus. Uh, read through the book of Revelation. You're going to see it over and over again. But this is the one spot that if you look and study this in the original language, it actually, that the way this is worded is that this promise is that when we've walked through and had our faith tested, when it's been refined by the fire, when we've walked through the suffering, when we've walked through the hardship, that we actually receive praise, glory, and honor. Now, it's not going to be praise, glory, and honor at the level that our Savior receives. Of course not. But this actually matches up with other scriptures. Think about this. Think about praise, right? Right? Jesus promises that at the end of everything, when those who are his come to him, what's he going to say as we enter eternity with him? He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. That sounds like praise to me. Glory, right? Just read 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, you should read 1 Corinthians 15 today. It's the resurrection chapter. This is Resurrection Sunday. You should read 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, but what's beautiful about 1 Corinthians 15 is that uh, uh, Paul talks about because we, uh, because Jesus rose from the dead, because Jesus received a glorified body, right? we will receive glorified bodies as well. And there's this beautiful thing. Uh, Peter or Paul basically says, hey, you're going to receive glory. You're going to be glorified for eternity. Again, not the same way that Jesus is, not the exact same way that Jesus is. He's still God and we never will be, but we receive the glory. It's awesome. Uh, praise, glory, 
and honor. It's just a, it's just a beautiful thing. Um, there's this description in Revelation of uh, those in Christ uh, receiving crowns of glory, receiving crowns of honor, right? Receive praise, glory, and honor. Now, now, obviously, it's not the crown like like the king would wear uh, for all eternity. In fact, the book of Revelation mentions that those who receive that crown then take it off and cast it before the feet of Jesus because uh, we don't need that honor. He is the only one that we want to honor. But it's this beautiful thing. Hey, brothers and sisters, when we're walking through hard times, when we're walking through trials, when we're walking through hardship, remember there will be a day that Jesus looks at us and says, well done, good and faithful servant, where he glorifies us and, 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 and takes away all those pains, all those tears, all those sorrows, all those dysfunction, all that disability, and it's all gone. And he honors us and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's beautiful. See, Peter says this, though you've not seen him, you love him. It's a weird thing. There's a new show on Netflix. It's really weird. I don't recommend it, okay? But it's called Love is Blind. And there's this whole experiment to see You know, hey, can you fall in love? And it's all romantic love and that kind of thing. But can you fall in love without ever seeing the other person? And um, so so the question they ask in that show over and over again is, is love blind? Brothers and sisters, I know it is. Because the one that I love more than anything, I've never seen. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, the one that you love more than anything, we've never seen. Even though you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you don't see him now. I love that now. Like, like Peter is reminding us, even though you don't see him now, there's going to be a day you see him later, beyond this, after this, on the other side of these trials, even though you don't see him now. Because we're with Jesus. Because we love Jesus, even though we don't see him now, we believe in him and we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, inexpressible and glorious joy. That word inexpressible is really, really weird in the Greek. It's a made up word. Peter made up a word here. It's awesome. Okay. But Peter made up this word. And this is what it means. It means can't get out of mouth. It's basically, he just, he just hyphenated this word. Uh, not really hyphenated because there's no hyphens in Greek, but, but he just jammed this, made this new compound word. And he just said, it's a joy that we can't get out of our mouth. We can't get it out of our mouth. We can't get it up. Like, 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 like it's, it's deep in us, but it doesn't make sense. There's not words to put on it. And brothers and sisters, because of the salvation we have in Jesus, we are filled with a joy that doesn't always make sense, that we can't always explain that we can't always, you know, logically reason out, but we're filled with a joy that goes beyond our circumstances, that goes beyond our situation, that goes beyond our, even our reality, right? And it goes into this supernatural place because it's an inexpressible and glorious joy. This is beautiful. I mean, do you see this? Because of the salvation we have, Because of this new birth into a living hope, because of this this, uh, hope in heaven, the inheritance that that, that we'll inherit, we can walk through hardship. We can walk through trying time. We can walk through whatever bad situation is thrown at us. And we can walk through it, not just with a grim determination, but we walk through it with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And if he has to remind us again, one more time, this big, it, it, what's amazing is Peter's so excited that he's finally writing a book. Uh, seriously, he's so excited he's finally writing a book. 30 years after Jesus has, has you know, resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven, 30 years later, Peter finally writes a book. And, and he's so excited about this idea that in the Greek, this is one big, long, run-on sentence. It's just, he's just, it's just a big, long sentence. There's no break. 
He just keeps going and it's overflowing. And you can just think he's so excited about it. And he comes and wraps kind of up this sentence a little bit with this same thing he started with, right? Hey, praise God, because we've got uh, salvation in Jesus. We've got this living this living hope, this new birth, right? And he says, you know, hey, we have an inexpressible and jo glorious joy because we're receiving the salvation of our soul, the result of our faith, the salvation of our soul. We have this in Jesus. So brothers and sisters, hear me loudly and clearly. I say none of this to discount what you're going through, to discount what we're walking through. It's bad. And you might be walking through something even worse you know, you might be walking through, you know, health complications and issues. You might be walking through tough relational things that are exacerbated by, by a quarantine and stay at home and all of that kind of stuff. You might be walking through anxiety and worry and depression. Okay, you might be walking through all kinds of hardship. And I don't say any of this to uh, knock down your hardship. What I do is say is this, is that there is hope for us scattered strangers because we have salvation in Christ. I love what Warren Wearsby says. It says, when you're in the furnace, God keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the clock. Okay, please know, even as you walk through this, God is with us and he is for you. And so my question for you today is this. Are you there? Have you received that, that, that new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus? Have you received the salvation that he promises you? If not, hear just a couple things from me. Know that, you know, that faith that we receive, that, that faith that we have, it comes through hearing the word of God. It comes through hearing the message of the gospel like you have already today. Uh, Peter later on in chapter one talks about how we, um, you know, how we receive, let me look here. It says um, that we have been born again, not through perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So that new birth comes when God's word gets planted deep in us and grows through us. It starts with hearing the message of the word and then it being obedient to the message. We proclaim our faith we proclaim and confess our faith. Jesus said that whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before my father. And it talks about obedience. One of the best ways that we show our obedience, one of the first ways that we show our obedience is in Christian baptism. We should talk about baptism more because here's the beauty of, uh, of baptism is it's perfect especially on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, I love what a Dr. Uh, Buford Bryant uh, wrote about uh, baptism. He said, the baptistry is a tomb and a womb. It's a tomb when we die to ourself and a womb when we're born again into the kingdom of God. See, this new hope, this living hope from a new birth through the resurrection of Jesus, uh, we talked about this earlier, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead does a new work in us. And all of that happens and all of that comes together in the beautiful imagery of the baptism. See, in the baptism, we die like Christ died. We're buried like Christ was buried, but also we rise again like Christ rose again. And we have this new birth into a living hope. And I just want to encourage you, even though we're disconnected and apart, if you... If you're thinking about your own relationship with Christ, if you want to talk more about what it means to become a Christian, please don't hesitate to reach out to me because I know this. For us scattered strangers, the one thing, the most important thing, the main thing that brings us hope is our salvation in Christ. There's hope, my brothers and sisters for us scattered strangers. Peace.